This is a one speaker meeting. Please welcome our speaker, speaker tonight, Daryl. Hi, my name's Daryl. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. I'm very happy to be here. I, uh, it's good to see all the newcomers, and uh, I, was, uh, I got sober April 1st, 1986, and uh, thanks to Alcoholics Anonymous, and especially the first step, um, it's revolutionized my way of thinking. I mean... If the first step just said we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, I would have been screwed <laughs> because I needed help with my life. I mean, I was not. I was the kid in fifth grade, I'll never forget. You know, they hand out the algebra books, right, in the beginning of the year. So what do I do? I open up the algebra book and go straight to the last page of the algebra book, and there's that huge problem, and I'm like, no fucking way. Boom. <laughs> And I was just like, what's the use? And that's the way I, uh, and at the same time, I swore to God, and this is as a young boy, I swore to God, I'm never going to be an alcoholic. I mean, I was eight years old, I'm never going to be an alcoholic. Because my mom, my mom was an alcoholic. And um, not that she really did anything bad to me, but it was very embarrassing and humiliating. And I thought, you know, I thought the whole world was going to judge me because of my mom's behavior. And she did all the normal stuff alcoholic moms do. You know, I'd be coming home from school just dreading, oh, no, what's it going to be? And sure enough, I'm within 10 feet of the front door, and I start hearing that Brazil 66. And I know I'm finished. You know, I walk inside, and she's like, come on, Daryl, dance with your mommy. And I'm like, oh, okay, Mom. <laughs> and then we'd have these school plays. <clears throat> I grew up in New Jersey. That doesn't contribute to my alcoholism, but I grew up in New Jersey. And uh, at the school, they'd have these, these plays these, in the auditorium, these assemblies during the day. And you know, all the mommies came because the daddies were working, right? So uh, all day long, all the other kids are going, is your mommy coming? Is your mommy coming? My mommy's coming. Is your and all the is, please, sweet Jesus, don't let my mommy come to this. <laughs> so I remember this one time I'm up there, we get like halfway through the show, and the room's filled like this. I mean, it looks like it's 20 miles away, and we're halfway through. And my mom's at the I'm like, okay, good. Only halfway to go. And all of a sudden, kachunka, those big kachunka doors that go kachunka, and the whole place turns around, and my mom's back there with the frosted hair and the tight sweater and the purse, and her pedal pushers going, my baby! <laughs> And then they all look up here, and I'm like going, okay, there's five other kids up here. There's, maybe they won't think it's me. And all of a sudden, Daryl! And I was like, oh, man, I just wanted to like fall on my cardboard sword and end it all. I was like, oh. And then later on at night, you know, my father would show up and she'd have this profound, now she went, you know, this profound personality change. And now she goes for the cutlery, you know, like alcoholic women do. And she starts chasing my dad around the, the kitchen, not really to hurt him or stab him, just to teach him a lesson, you know. And then when she, okay, well, she probably figured I'll get into big trouble if I stab this jerk. So she throws the silverware down, takes off her blouse, her pants, what are you doing, Billy? And whoom, out the door. And now my father's going, you got to get her, get her. And my name, I'm like, I walk to school. I walk to fucking school. So all the kids are, go and the porch lights are coming up, and I'm just like, forget it. You know? So I swear to God, I'm never going to be an alcoholic. It just did not look like fun. It looked like hell. And you know what? <clears throat> I've been in AA long enough to know that this is a disease. And whether you want it or not, if you got it, I'll tell you what. When I took my first drink, it was the, it couldn't have been any, I can't imagine how not everybody else, how non-alcoholics 
did not feel as good as I felt. I'll, I'll remember, you know, I'll remember that first drink till the, till the day I die because it was that, it, it, it changed everything. There's a joke in AA, you probably heard it a billion times, but I'll tell it anyway, um, that, you know, this guy was like 40 years sober. Sorry about that. This guy was 40 years sober, sober as a judge, going to meetings, loving his life, has a heart attack, he dies, right? No big deal, had a great life. He's in the morgue now, so they go to do the autopsy. They cut him up, the, the, the coroner takes, the spot, takes his brain out, Brings it over to a beaker, drops it in the beaker alcohol, turns it around, and she hears, ah. <laughs> and you know what? When I tell that story to this day, I still feel that, like, ah. And believe me, this is years and years of it being, believe me, I wouldn't stick around for 20, it's going to be 21 years, God. I wouldn't stick around this long one day at a time if this wasn't a hell of a lot better. Trust me. Um, so I, uh, you know, I had that first drink. I'll tell you what. I didn't feel like my mom. You know, I felt good when I drank. That's what I thought, you know. But, you know, when they talk about that first drink, it's the first drink that gets you. They mean the first fucking drink. Because I had drink. I had been trying to capture, even on the end, even at the end, I mean at the end, I knew there were going to be bad consequences, but in the end, I didn't care about the consequences. I just didn't want to feel, for just five minutes, ten minutes, I don't want to feel like I'm feeling right now. And I had no idea that Alcoholics Anonymous was going to give me a solution to that. That's what I mean by the second half, because it's a solution to that unmanageable. If you're having a problem with the word unmanageable, like I did, you know, I thought, well, I didn't really get caught for everything I did, and I called this one and got out of that one. Well, that doesn't, that's not what they mean by managing. <laughs> substitute, <laughs> substitute the word unmanageable with unbearable, and it was unbearable. In my gut, it was unbearable. I couldn't run away from it. And if you're new, if you're new, I strongly suggest you get a copy of the big book. And this is how it was suggested to me. Just two pages a night. You could read two pages a night. Anyone can read two pages a night. And you start reading that, and the stories in the back are good. I know you hear a lot of people say the first 164, first 164, but there's good shit in the back. You know, and I go to a meeting, try to go to two meetings, and this was suggested to me, one where it's a big book where you read from the book. So you get to... Let me tell you, when you're sitting in a circle with other alcoholics and you're reading along with them, you tend to pay attention, at least I do, because it might be my turn to share soon, so I gotta look like I know what we're reading. <laughs> so it forces me to pay attention, and I'm listening to what everyone's saying, and you know what, in spite of myself, I'm getting a little better. And listen, you read two pages, if you have trouble falling asleep at night, trust me, two pages, kapoof, you're out. <laughs> But the good news is, the good news is, what happens is, I'm doing the first three steps before I go to bed without it, meaning I obviously think I have a problem with alcohol and I can't do anything about it, right? My life's unmanageable. I wouldn't be reading Alcoholics Anonymous before bed, you know, in my bed. And I obviously came to believe that just maybe, just maybe by just doing what these people say works for them, Maybe I'll get better. You know, my first 30 days, I remember I started thinking, and it was a miracle, I started thinking, you know, if I just get up, and my sponsor gave me a morning routine. Like, you hear a lot, there's one day at a time, one day at a time. I hear one day, how the hell do you live one day at a time? My head was so full of remorse from all the crap I had ever done, and I was so full of regret, of, or not regret, but impending doom. You know, what's going to happen because of this? I was like, every morning was my whole life and my whole, how do you live? And they gave me a simple morning routine. And the guy said, look, and I got sober. <clears throat> well, let me tell you how I ended up, where I ended up that first meeting. I, uh, you know, if you're having a problem with higher powers, this is another one of our problems. Trust me, we've had thousands of higher powers, and I'll tell you. I'll tell you all of mine. 
once I go to college, everything's going to be okay. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to get my shit together, and I'm going to make something of myself. You know what? Once I get this girlfriend, I could still see her in my head. Once I get this girlfriend, Susan, she's got great parents. I'll be good. They'll take care of me, and everything will be okay. Once I get rid of this broad, that's my problem, or old man hates me. You know, this school is for chumps. I just need a real job, you know? And it was one thing after the other. It was like, if you read the book, there's this little chapter more about alcoholism. It, and I remember reading that for the first time. You know, it talks about, we tried spiritual books, tried changing, you know, from beer to wine, from whiskey to vodka, I don't know, I mean, all this stuff. Joined health clubs. I, I, I went to any lengths. I was 21 years old. You know what I thought? I'm not going to join a health club. I'm going to work at Jack Elaine's Health Spa. <laughs> You know, so I got this job at Jack Lane Health Spa, and I'm going to be healthy, God damn it! And I'm going there, and now, you know, like everything else, it starts wearing off. So I'm drinking at night now, and now I'm hungover during the day, and I'm supposed to be doing calisthenic classes, you know, teaching these old, older ladies how to do... I'm 21 years old, you know, so I'm supposed to be in tip-top shape, right? I'm hungover. I can't even do the push-ups I'm making senior citizens do, right? <laughs> So, I'm, so, so I get this brain fart, get up and start checking, like to look like I'm a good leader, you know, so because I can't do them. So I go up and I go, ooh, come on, you can do that, Mrs. Adams. Uh, excellent ladies, you in the back, come on now. Meanwhile, I'm just disguising. I'm lying to myself, right? And then this one day, one day for some strange reason, I decided to bring a gallon of Gallo wine I don't even drink this. I don't know how. The glass green big thing, and I had a twist off little tin lid, you know, and it would click, 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 and now it's open, and it could crunch the lid. And that lid was good because when I finally ended up like hiding out in my place, you could scrunch it over the little peep thing, and it always looks like it's dark inside. Beer caps work good, all that stuff, guys. No one will know you're home. It looks dark inside. No, he's not home. So, um,. So listen, this is what happens to me. I have my gallon of Gallo wine today at Jack Lane's Fitness Center. So I'm drinking my Gallo wine, and all of a sudden, I'm coming alive. So I'm like, Mr. I love my job, you know, because I'm getting that good beginning buzz the alcoholic gets. This is the thing. My mind constantly, before I, I mean, like it says, you know, lack of power was my dilemma. I had no faith that anything good was ever going to happen to a jerk like me. Because deep down, I knew I kept screwing up. And deep down, even though I thought I was getting over, I knew I wasn't. And I was all, I, it was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? But when I drank, all those thoughts of, oh, Daryl, you're a jerk. Oh, that girl's never gonna talk to you. What a loser. Forget it. You screw everything up. Now I'm taking drinks, and now it's like, <laughs> so now these negative thoughts start getting drunk. So they have no power over me. So I'm feeling good. I'm free of all this negative thinking. It was like it was being anesthetized. So I'm loving my Jack Lane job, polishing weights. Let me help you with that, Mr. Jones. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm, so I'm having a little more. And now I'm starting to change a little bit. Now all of a sudden I'm like, these fucking rich pricks. <laughs> I mean, just because, just because I'm from Clifton, New Jersey, and this is Livingston, poo-hoo, and I'm starting to have all these thoughts. So now, at the end of the day, the manager said what he normally always said was, Daryl, look, don't forget to wipe down the weights. No big deal, any other day. But now, I'm like, you clean the weights. And he's like, what? I said, you heard me. That's it, I'm telling the boss. So he starts running up the stairs. So I'm like, you little girl, come back here. I go running up the stairs, we're in front of the main thing. There's tennis, you know, paddle ball, they're all glass. And I'm up there, and <clears throat> this is where it gets ugly. You know, he goes, this guy's drunk, this guy's no good. Get him out of here, or I'm leaving. This is the, the other guy. And I said, what? And I saw, like, I guess it was an episode of F Troop, and I just took his name tag, and I tore off his name tag, I threw it on the ground, I stepped on it, and I said, you know what, screw that, I quit. And I walked out of there, I showed them 
one more time. And the next day, waking up, humiliated. Humiliated. What did I do? Embarrassed. Like, a, I know the bottles in my life. I didn't even go back to pick up my clothes. I didn't go back to pick up my last paycheck. And that was just one of many jobs. Because when I woke up, I would realize the truth. And you know what I do when I feel like that? I drink again. So I, um, this phenomenon of craving thing, you know, when I was brand new, I could argue with whatever, anybody, a any difference of anybody up at the podium. But when I heard that thing where they talk about the phenomenon of craving, that was the one thing I could not argue with. And I remember hearing someone say it from the podium. They said, you know, once I take a drink, you know, the doctors, I'm just like the doc, once I take a drink, I gotta have more. And I remember thinking, shit, man, when I was 16, I was like, I was like talking with my friends all the time. You know, once I have one, I got to have more. And they're like, yeah, whatever. But I mean, I didn't know that was a symptom of alcoholism. And I couldn't argue with that, you know. And this is the thing. This phenomenon of craving is brutal. And I'll tell you why. My mom left shortly after that. Like, I was about eight years old. And she just, she just couldn't do it. She couldn't raise two kids, and be alcoholic. And you know what? If you stick around long enough, you get to enough meetings, and you hear things that help you. And I'm at enough meetings, I'm going to meetings, and I hear this guy start talking. His dad's the alcoholic. He hates his dad. And I'm like, I have this. I, mean, I occasionally suffer from Jersey Tourette's, right? So he starts going, he starts going, my dad. You know, I hated my dad, he was the alcoholic, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, pal, grow some pants. But I learned in AA, I gotta look to identify, so I'm like, okay, back up, back up. And then I, let the, and then I heard what he said, he said, you know what? And then one day I was driving to a meeting, and it dawned on me, my dad didn't wanna be an alcoholic either. And I'm going, oh. My mom, believe it or not, folks, felt as good as every one of us in here when she drank. She wasn't purposely trying to hurt me. And you know how I know? Because when I was 18 years old, my dad was dying of cancer. And it was just him, me, and my younger brother. And he raised us all by himself. And uh, he was dying of cancer. And this day, it was it. The ambulance came to the house. And we knew his number was up. And they took him away. And the neighbors are all going, hey, we saw the ambulance. How's your father? And I'm like, he's fine. He's fine. You know, because I didn't want anyone to know that he was weak. I, I was still sick. I was an alcoholic. I was young, and I thought I'd be judged. I don't know what I thought. But you know what I knew? I knew if I had just one drink, I'd be able to handle this. And I could show up to the hospital like a man, you know, and be a good son. Well, I had a drink. And I called up my friends, Frankie Dragato and Jeff Angelo. I'll never forget it. I said, my dad's in the hospital. Come over. Let's have a few drinks. And they said, great. And we had a few drinks. And now you know what happens when I have a few more drinks? I'll tell you what happens. The most significant things in my life become <coughs> second to my selfish desire to feel even better. And I'm, I'll tell you, this is what was going through my head. A couple hours go by, it's like 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. They're like, hey, you want to go to the hospital now, Daryl? No, no, just a few more, just a few more. Come on, come on. Oh, so-and-so's got some Coke. Yeah, why not? Don't worry, it's midnight. They're going, you sure you don't want to go? I'm his son, they'll let me in any time. You know, this is what I'm thinking. I'm, I couldn't stop. Two o'clock, three o'clock, pass out, find out the next day. Yeah, you know, Jimmy died last night. You don't think, do you really think I didn't want to be there? This is just like the guy who says, honey, I'm just going to have one drink with the guys and I'll be home. So what did I do the next day? I felt like crap. And what do I do when I feel like crap? I gotta get some more shit. I gotta get drunk. I need some relief, you know? Any lengths. I had no idea this was alcoholism. I avoided, I ran away. I avoided pain like the plague. 
you know what? I want a quick fix. And I'll tell you, this program, I, I there were days, this is reminding me of a whole bunch of stuff. I was just thinking, I actually ended up working at the Honolulu Police Department, believe it or not. I got into so much trouble in the military <laughs> that once I got sober, they thought it'd be a good idea to throw me into law, into working with them. It was like the mod squad, but I didn't know what I was doing, so I had to like, I'm like tossing, I'm, thank God I was in this program because I just rely on these steps. You know, I would just toss the responsibility of all this stuff on my higher power. There's a, a magazine called The Grapevine. You know what I mean? It's this magazine. It looks like the little Jehovah Witness watchtower. It's a little, I mean, it's very humbling, but you roll it up, you keep it in your pocket. You know, I kept it in my uniform. I still subscribe to it. You know, occasionally there's a good joke in there. Most of the time there isn't. There was actually a good one a couple years ago, and it's embedded in my head. It's this good, I'll tell you. It says in the joke, it says, you know what? It finally dawned on me that an AA meeting is just like an orgy because when it's all over, I feel great, but I just don't know who to thank. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm going, that's a pretty good joke. <laughs> See, if you don't give up five minutes before the miracle, you know, you come across these things. It was well worth the wait, trust me. <laughs> But I would read my little books, you know, I'd, instead of running to the bathroom to do a few lines, I'd read my gra gra the grapevine. And you know what? It didn't even matter what I was reading most of the time. But what it did was I'd start thinking about guys in the, in the meetings that I knew. It just tapped my train of thought in the right direction. And I would think, man, I'm getting better. I don't want to get back. But what, it, what I was thinking of to tell you is where we would process people after they got arrested there was this sign, and it said, don't feel so bad. You know, all hope is not lost, because right now, you, are, you have become an excellent example of a bad example. <laughs> and it's, it's just the thing you need as you're like, oh, <laughs> oh. But for us, it's just the type of thing I need to just put that extra little boom, in the side of the head, the chink in the arm or my ego, where I'm like, I can't do this. I really am a mess. And I was going to say, you know, I thought I could never change. That's what I was afraid of. I would see people that seemed like they could function in life or people that had to, you know what I mean? They just seemed to have it all together. And I was like, why couldn't I be born him? Why would I have to be born me? I never get the breaks. But let me tell you, you do a fourth step like I have done, and what happens is you get to see, you know, this powerless over alcohol is pretty. Every decision I made up until the point I got into AA was all based on my alcoholism. You know, once I go to that school, this is what happened. I got to that school because I had some, I had a scholarship because I was talented in art, and that was the only reason I got in. And what do they do to the freshmen at art school? They take you to the senior art exhibit, like the first week. It's great for the well-adjusted art student. Big mistake <laughs> for me. So we walk in, and I see this stuff, and what do I do? What's the use? So what do I do? I drink. And you know, when I drink, I get the feeling of accomplishment without even having to do anything. <laughs> and you know what? I was thinking the other day, I go to a meeting every morning. And at the meeting, someone was talking about yeah, you know, I was on the computer with the webcam, and, you know, I was drunk. I was a little humiliated because they saw me on the other end. I'm going, holy shit. Oh, my God. You know, thank God those things weren't around when I was. I mean, I was fortunate. No caller ID, no, like, see you on the phone thing. So I'm, like, calling old girlfriends, you know, that I terrorized or left flat or whatever at 3 in the morning. Their phone rings, and it's not like now where they go, oh, this prick, click, ignore. No, I mean, that, they were like, oh, my God, was my grandmother killed? And I'd be like, hey, I love you, I love you. It's like, oh. You know? And I was, think and then I was thinking, you know, all these things, you know, the answering machine. I'd come home, I'd see the blinking light on the answering machine. I'd just be like, ugh, my stomach. I couldn't go anywhere. This program, um, 
you know, these steps, I always want, I was going to say, I always wanted times where I got in a lot of trouble, I'd go, God, if I could just go back in time, I would have never done, oh. Let me tell you something. This program has allowed me to go back in time and transform my past, and my past has now transformed my future. What? Can you tell me something? Okay. <laughs> Only five more minutes, folks. Hang in. <laughs> so, uh, and I'll, and, you know, and one of them was, I'm no saint. I talk about my mom, but let me tell you a little secret. I got to, through this program, you know, I got to be the best son I could be, you know, to my mother. And I got to make a lot of other amends. You know, I had a younger brother, and my younger brother joined the Air Force under my coercion early so I wouldn't have to be responsible. And then I could pretend to still be the bigger brother who's somewhat succeeding, you know, by writing those bullshit letters. Yeah, I'm running for city council. Uh, you know, <laughs> meanwhile, my life's in the toilet. And I was so ashamed of him ever bumping into me, like, of him ever seeing me. Now, like when I was in that state. And uh, you know what happens is you get these, you do these steps, you work these steps, they become part of your life. And not too long ago, I was thinking about, I, I used to steal money from my dad's card playing money. They play cards every Thursday night at my house. It was a gr that's, that's when I had my first drink. They would, we'd get to serve <laughs> screwdrivers and ah, oh, it was heaven. I, always, I would have done anything to have been like these guys, right? And uh, so I would, during the week, steal a couple quarters here, a couple quarters there, and just like everywhere else. Like after I left college, I ended up pumping. I didn't, well, I, you know, I mean, I kind of wormed out of college before they said get out, you know, failing, but sneaking out the back door so I could say I chose to do it, that sort of thing. And I'm working at this gas station, and I'm hiding every time kids from school would come in because I didn't want them to see me there, you know, and I'm stealing from the register. You know, it starts off with 10 bucks, you see if he notices. Next day, 20, a week later, 50s, you know, and then I start justifying it. Well, of course, you know, I, he's paying me minimum wage. I got a couple of years of college under my belt, this ass. You know, I'm justifying it, and kids from school are coming in. I'm dodging them. I'm like, yeah, you handle that one. I'd run into the, like, inside, like I had to do something. And one time, one of the kids from school popped in, and he goes, Darrell, what are you doing here? We missed you all semester. And I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? I make more money managing this stinking gas station <laughs> than I'd ever make if I graduate from that preppy ass school you're going to. <laughs> but getting back on track, I'm still in quarters, just like later on, I'm still in quarters for my dad's car playing money. Now my mom's out of the house, but she's still drinking. She shows up from time to time when she needs help, you know, just like we do. Help me, Jimmy, you know, that sort of thing, just like I became. So uh, one day my dad goes, hey, have you seen your mother around? I go, why? He goes, because I'm missing some money from the card money. I think she might be taking it. And I'm like 10 years old. I'm like, yeah, I think she was here, Dad. <laughs> so it's 18, 19 years later. I'm sober. I mean, not eight, more than that. I'm sober 19 years. And I'm thinking, this is like, shit, 20 years later. And I'm thinking about it, thinking about it. So when you think about these things, you can't justify them anymore. You work these steps, and even if you oh, that's not a big deal. Oh, she left when I was little. Oh, I've been a good son to her. Urgh, you got to make the amends. So I call her up, and I go, Ma, it's Daryl. Oh, hi, Daryl. You know, she's sometimes a little nutty, sometimes not. Hi, Daryl. And I go, Ma, i got to tell you something. I go, do you remember when we were living at the house, you know, when you left and stuff? And I go, let me, I was stealing quarters from Dad, and I blamed you for it. And she said, oh, she goes, we do crazy things when we're young, don't we? And I, and I said, yeah, ma. And then she started to get a little choked up, and she said, Daryl, the hardest thing I ever did was to leave you two boys. And I said, mommy, I love you. And you know what? If I did with some of these people I hear complain at the morning meeting, they go, I got to get my mother. Ah, she was evil. I got to make her say amends to me. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I change, and my past changes. I mean, I could go on and on. I could tell you how I, I can go on and on and on, but this is all the time I have, you know, to share. <laughs> so you get off the hook. But what I can say is, what I can say is, <clears throat> If you're new, if you're new, 
Just get a big book and start just reading two pages. Just two pages a night. And you know, if you want it, if you really want it, you'll get it. If you want your life to change, you'll get it because you'll want to do the work. And if you don't want it, you ain't going to get it. You know? But let me tell you, if at 23 years old, I could still be here 21 years later, I'm telling you, you don't have to keep going out either. I did the silly things. Back in New York, oh, these guys have a saying. They go, don't drink no matter what, even if your ass falls off. Now, wait, it gets better. We've heard that, right? They go, even if your ass falls off. And you know what, Daryl? If your ass falls off, pick it up, put it in a plastic bag in case it leaks, and get your ass to a meeting and find a new way to sit. And I'm like, yes, sir. (laughs) And I'm going to leave you with this one last thing. This one guy, Joe Landry, I never liked the guy, but you know what? You go to meetings, and they put stuff in your head. The guys you think you hate, save your ass. This guy, Joe Landry, gets up at a meeting in like my first 30 days, and he says this. He goes, folks, I got great news for you. There's only two times you want to go to a meeting. And it's funny because even the people I'm looking around, like, have like 37 years, 99 years, I go, ooh. <laughs> and I'm like, ooh, only two times? Yeah, when you want to and when you don't. Ah! So now what happens, <laughs> now what happens is, I swear to God, I'll have time to go to a meeting. I got a lovely wife now and stuff. It's at night. You know, and she wants to watch the surreal life or whatever nonsense. I go, I can say, when you want to and when you don't. <laughs> and I go to the meeting, and I get to go home after the meeting, and I get to spend quality time with wifey. And now when she says, and she wants to give me a little kiss, instead of going, shh, 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 this is a shh, and I got, you know, medical detectives or something, shh, now I just go, and I just let her give me a kiss. And I realized I never had it this good in my life. In my life. So thanks. I would like to thank Louis for reading Chapter 5 and Tom for reading The Twelve Traditions. Are there any secretaries announced? I'm Robert. I'm an alcoholic. I'm Robert. Uh, uh, perhaps you've seen me uh, my work on court TV. Uh, uh, um, let's thank Daryl for speaking tonight. <clears throat> you were a cop. Anyway, um, and let's thank Jessica, uh, Jennifer for leading a great meeting. Mike, you want to uh, recant our newcomers and out-of-towners and people who took chips and cakes? You got it. Uh, Mike Lockhart. Mike? Um, tonight we've uh, been blessed with uh, wonderful newcomers. Um, Jay, Mike, Jerry, Henry, Chuck, Jerry, Ron, and Luis. Welcome home. Hey. Hey. Out-of-towner Richard from London, England. Hey. Hey. He is. Good deal. Can everyone who has a, a commitment stand and uh, notify us of your presence and uh, anything you'd like to share? William, alcoholic, I'm bringing the birthday cake. William. Uh, I'm Jim, your alcoholic H&I representative. And uh, H&I is the area of Alcoholics Anonymous. We help bring literature and panels into psych wars and jails. And, it, you know, we, all, we know them. <laughs> and uh, it's a great program.
Come talk to me if you'd like to take that commitment after the meeting. Mike? Parish. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Dave. Uh, can women who've been through all the 12 steps and are available for some uh, interim, short-term, or general sponsoring, please stand or raise your hands for us. These are the ones to look for after gals if you're looking for a sponsor. And the men who have been through the steps and are willing to sponsor short-term or otherwise? Cool. Back to you, dear. Thanks for letting me be of service. Thank you, Robert, for allowing me to lead. Um, this has been a regular Wednesday night speaker meeting. Thank you for coming and keep coming back. Now, after a moment of silent meditation for the alco alcoholic who still suffers, would Mike lead us in the Lord's Prayer? <laughs> 